got the airplane pre flighted and everything, so we're ready to go. All we need to do is jump in and head for Houston. Back to you, sir. This is John Denver inviting you to climb aboard and join us for a trip that can only be described as far out. We've got a date today with a dream, one of man's oldest, the dream of flight. We're going to go places today where even the birds have never been. We'll be doing everything from ballooning to barnstorming to blasting off. Along the way, we'll meet some heroes, a couple of geniuses, and some people like you and me. But most of all, I can promise you we're going to have some fun. I hope you folks recognize me, but I'm not sure you recognize the gentleman on my right. He's my father, Dutch Dutchendorf. He's been a pilot all his life. He taught me how to fly. Simply couldn't do this film without him. For a long time, I couldn't even get him in an airplane. Now, can't keep him out of it. Yeah, but I tell you what, I think he enjoys it as much as I do. You can say that again. <laughs> Want you folks to sit down, strap your seat belts on. Over the next hour, we're going to take you to a place you've probably never been before. You better hang on, because we're going to be going for it. That's it. We're going to fire up a balloon and float over the Colorado Rockies. We'll take a sentimental journey back to Kitty Hawk to fly an exact reproduction of the Wright Brothers' original flyer. We're going to find out what made those daring young men and women so daring back in the romantic days of barnstorming. And for a fantastic thrill, we'll plunge through the sound barrier in one of the world's fastest jets. So check those seat belts again, because this flight is ready to go. took man beyond the pull of gravity to float free on the edge of space. By the end of the decade, the rock-covered moon had become a stepping stone to infinity. Who can say where the space shuttle will take us tomorrow? At Palomar Observatory, we'll peer into the depths of space and wonder at the possible life forms we may discover there. experience the thrill of flying the highest performance jets and then we'll just lie back a little and enjoy the fun of floating over the Rockies or rocking into a barrel roll. We'll even get a little hilarious at New York's Rhinebeck Aerodrome where expert pilots spoof the legendary aces of World War I. You don't have to be the Red Baron to figure out that everybody from Rickenbacker to von Richthofen gets kitted in these weekend melodramas. for a couple of hundred years. In those brave old days, though, the way you did it was to carry a bonfire in a basket under a highly flammable bag made of paper or cloth. If it strikes you that it wasn't the safest way of getting off the ground, you're right. But at the time, it was the only way. In recent years, the development of the propane burner and flame proofing has been responsible for putting balloons back in the air. This ancient pastime has now become a safe, spectacular, and enormously popular sport. Rallies like this one at Snowmass, Colorado, now bring balloonists together all over the world. Here at Snowmass, the high Rockies provide a majestic backdrop for these colorful giants. If anybody asks you what time the balloon is going up, you're generally safe if you tell them right after sunup since the wind conditions for hot air ballooning are best soon after dawn. It's the kind of sport that gets you up early. Let me do goose at one time. The very first time we actually got off the ground, it wasn't on the Wright Brothers' wings. In fact, it was before the combustion engine was even a good idea. 
It was way back on November 21st, 1783, right? Right. In a hot air balloon. <laughs> Hang on. Everybody up. There you go. We're still doing it today because it's great. When the Montgolfier brothers sent their first balloon up in Paris in 1783, it drew an enormous crowd. Among the onlookers was Benjamin Franklin, our ambassador to France at the time. As the balloon rose into the air, someone asked Franklin, of what possible use is it? And Franklin's answer, as usual, was right to the point. Of what possible use, he replied, is a newborn baby. Well. Floating along in the breeze, suspended from a bubble of hot air, is great fun, but don't ever confuse it with powered, controlled flight. It took 120 years following that first balloon ascension in 1783 and the genius of the Wright brothers to solve the riddle of the ages and get man off the ground in powered flight for the first time. A hot air balloon can get you off the ground, but what about wings? Men have always envied birds their place in the sky, but it took two bicycle mechanics from Ohio, Wilbur and Orville Wright, to show us how to join the birds in powered flight. Here on Kill Devil Hill near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, we've returned to the exact spot where the Wright brothers' original flyer first took to the air on that historic December 17th in 1903. My dad and I have returned here, along with some friends, to see if we can make history repeat itself. With my wife Annie here to give encouragement, and dad supplying plenty of supervision, we're off to a good start. We're all here to join Ken and Nancy Kellett, a young couple from Colorado. Ken has built an exact replica of the original Wright Flyer. My dad seems to feel that the untried replica may be just as dangerous to fly as the original. We're here to answer the same question the Wright brothers must have asked themselves on that December day in 1903. Will it fly? To really appreciate the giant step the Wright brothers took here at Kitty Hawk, it helps if you imagine someone asking you to design an airplane and you had never seen one. Since their flyer had no wheels, it was launched from a trolley on a greased skid. We'll be doing it the same way. The brothers were far from being ordinary bicycle mechanics who somehow stumbled onto the airplane through dumb luck. It took years of study and experimentation and repeated failure before they got it right. And along the way, danger was a constant companion. To attempt a takeoff from the same spot as the Wright brothers has to give you a feeling of awe. If this flyer takes to the air, it will be like leaving hallowed ground. By today's sophisticated standards, that attempt may look like a failure. But when the Wrights flew that long in 1903, few would believe it had happened at all. I guess everybody in love with flying wants to go farther, faster, and higher. I know we're ready to give it another try. It was a strange combination of Wilbur's noticing the way a buzzard's wingtips turned down as it banked in flight, and his twisting a long box from which he was unpacking a bicycle inner tube that led the brothers to a momentous breakthrough. They theorized that by twisting or warping the wingtips, they might be able to keep the machine on an even keel. This they accomplished by cleverly rigging a set of cables which the pilot could control by shifting his hips. last flight of the day does a little damage, but the original flyer also cracked up before the technique was perfected. But it flew. It flew, yeah. Well, listen, I tell you what, I really admire anybody that sets out to do something and goes for it and does it. And you did that. You, you built that airplane, you made it fly, you proved you could do it. I congratulate you. Thanks, John.
heck of a job. Once the first plane was off the ground, everybody wanted to get into the act. The idea of flying took off overnight. Hiya, folks. Guess who? This sculpture is called Ad Astra, and it means to the stars. And that's what this place is all about. This is the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institute here in Washington, D.C. And this is the most incredible museum I've ever been in. Everywhere you look around here are fantastic dinosaurs of, of space and flight. I mean, that, that's the real Kitty Hawk flyer, you know? Over here is the spirit of St. Louis the X-15 rocket plane that bridged the gap between man and the stars, the Pioneer spacecraft. More people have visited this museum than any other museum in the world. Over 33 million people since it opened in 1976. I'm here because this place supports one of the things that I really strongly believe in, and that's our continued exploration of space. I mean, this is like a, a grand history of American achievement, keeping the memories alive in our hearts and in our minds. Nine, eight, seven, all engines are started. Two, one, zero, we have a liftoff. The Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling birds of sun split clouds and done a hundred things I've wheeled and soared and swung high in the sun that silence hovering there I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless fall This place is a reminder of the mind-boggling places that we've already been, but even more importantly, it's an inspiration for the challenges that lie ahead. Above the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never To meet those challenges, NASA's giant space shuttle. Okay, and we're 
the world's first reusable spaceship. And you've got control of the airplane. Okay, got it. And I'm holding 240 knots. Designed to blast off like a rocket and land like a glider, this is our ticket to the future. But you'll see for yourselves, we're about to leave on a simulated flight into space. Roger. Showing 36, I'm on line. Look at the Mach number, 3.4. Now, this thing is really moving at this time, and we're coming down rapidly. We're at 83,000 feet, 290 knots now. Okay, we're going to ask you to give us a nice, gentle 30-degree bank turn when you get up to the heading alignment circle. Roger. Hello, Columbia. Chase one on board. Okay, I'm starting to see a runway up here. Got 265 knots. We're lined up. 12,000 feet. I'll arm the landing gear. All right. And it's asking for that uh, little pitch down to get uh, 290 knots. Roger. There, we're at 300 knots. We're looking good. We're at 7,000 feet. Designed for Earth orbital flights of up to 30 days each, the shuttle can carry seven people and 65,000 pounds of payload, including research equipment for studying astronomy, weather, and communications, among other things. Now, okay. Go ahead and let the nose come on down. Wheels are on their way. Nose coming up. 400 feet, 300 feet, 250, 200, 150, 100, 80, 70, 8, 40, 30, 20, 5, 5, 3, 2, straight right down. Out. Okay, nose wheel on the ground. We'll steer back over the runway center line. Okay, John, you're on the ground. Looks good. Okay, folks, keep your seats. Next stop, Palomar, and a thrilling look into infinity. I'm on Palomar Mountain, riding the dome of the Hale Telescope. Now, people call this the world's greatest eye because its powers are so enormous. It collects the light of a million human eyes. It can pick up candlelight at a distance of 10,000 miles. It can see 10,000 million light years into space. I mean, what we are seeing in the night sky may be the death of a star, a long past event, the light of which is only just now reaching us. Not even the stars are eternal. Stars live and die. It's us, a living and a living entity. As far as I'm concerned, the stars are life in the universe. The star out, yeah. is born out of dust and gas. It lives and it dies. What is a galaxy? A galaxy is a family of stars. A f a f that's how you would describe yes, it. Yes, a hundred billion stars moving together under the mutual gravity in a giant spiral pattern like Andromeda. Now, our galaxy is the Milky Way. That's right. So, what was at the beginning then? It was like a cosmic egg. The universe began with this big bang of hydrogen and heat, in which all the energy and ultimately all the matter of the universe was concentrated uh -huh. by finding that the more distant objects moved faster and faster away from us we deduced that it was not just a simple motion but that space itself was expanding the sun gave birth to the planets we think in a much more peaceful way at a very low temperature in fact against this enormous temperature measurable only in the billions and billions of degrees yeah. at the beginning of time. What was the Earth like originally? Well, we sort of think it was like these pockmarked planets that we see from space now, covered with debris formed by the gradual accumulation of impacting small asteroid-type bodies, hunks of rock hurtling in. The early history of our planet and the origins of life on it remain shrouded in mystery. Scientists can only speculate on the convulsions which led to the formation of cells capable of reproducing themselves. In one of my favorite poems, Langdon Smith says it best. When you were a tadpole and I was a fish in the Paleozoic time, 
and side by side on the ebbing tide, we sprawled through the ooze and slime. The eons came, and the eons fled, and the sleep that wrapped us fast was riven away in a newer day, and the night of death was past. Thus, life by life, and love by love, we pass through the cycle strange, and breath by breath, and death by death, we follow the chain of change. With space exploration, we've looked through our own solar system, a rough dozen planets and 20 satellites or thereabouts. They're all miserable places, you know, we wouldn't live there. Yeah. We seem to be in a very strangely fortunate world. What you're looking for most specifically is that other stars like our sun probably have planets around them, is that right? I was interested mostly, since there is a great interest, and other intelligences and other worlds, and first finding if there was one other world in which anything could live. How many galaxies are there? Do we know? Well, we really don't know. That's one of the main goals of the study of cosmology and the expanding universe. But the guess is that there are somewhere between hundreds of millions and some billions of galaxies. Galaxies. And each one has a population of a hundred billion stars like our sun. There's no end to it, the real problem. Is, is there no end to it? We don't know. That's <laughs> oh, really? We, we don't know. Science is built. Science up. cannot tell you that. It, not yet. We look at these things. We look at more and more distant ones. We strain our equipment and our mind. It's the process that we're trying to find out. Yeah. Because there's no point in giving an answer in advance. Doors beyond doors. I wish we could see through yeah. one of them. It's going to take very special means. It's going to take different kinds of telescopes. For example, the work in the infrared, where you detect the heat radiation of a planet relatively more easily than its reflected light. We also send messages into space, abstract attempts to explain who we are. Since life is we... Why did I start the Rhinebeck Aerodrome? I just thought old airplanes ought to have a fine old home. Why are people interested in old airplanes with such marvelous, sophisticated airplanes flying around today? With the old airplanes, it can be one man by himself controlling the whole situation. I think it's human nature to want to do the whole thing themselves. The individualist. Oh, that thing's going to need some grease. Hmm. My name's Dave Fox. I've been flying here for 25 years at Old Rhinebeck and enjoying every minute of it. I started flying in 1934 in Texas, and I've got about 20,000 hours now. And I guess these are more fun than anything else I've flown. There's not only a certain amount of ego to it, but there's a euphoria that comes over you. If you fly the thing and fly it well, you know that you've done it. And nobody can tell you there's no electricity, so there's obviously no radio for somebody on the ground to tell you you're doing wrong or what you're supposed to do next. And of course, it was always a thrill to uh, get up and look down. There's nothing quite like it on a beautiful day. You break out and see the ground for the first time. It's a, it's a thrill. I never got over that. The crowd jammed the bleachers every summer weekend here at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome, a hundred miles up the Hudson River from New York City. What they've come to see is an old-fashioned air show put on by some of the best stunt pilots in the world. The planes they fly are the tuned-up relics of World War I, open cockpit planes with names like the Sopwith Camel, Spad, Jenny, the Fokker DR-1 triplane. These are the planes that made legends of the famous aces, Emmelman, Rickenbacker, and the Red Baron himself, von Richthofen. Here at Rhinebeck, the legends are gently kitted. Like the aces they are spoofing, these pilots too fly by the seats of their pants. But their dog fights are more bark than bite, and their bombs more smoke than shrapnel.
circus, you don't need a program to tell the bad guys from the good guys. The damsel in distress may be tied to a barrel instead of a railroad track, but nobody doubts for a minute that she'll survive. The heroes are all pure of heart in this nostalgic look back, and we know before it's all over, the villain will get it in the end. The uh, space program, I think it's a marvelous thing. My father delivered mail in a horse and buggy, and he lived to see Sputnik. A wonderful time to be alive. The use of space is going to be necessary to continue the progress of man. It's going to lead the way to long-term space population. There are actually going to be generations within the next hundred years who were born and raised in space. To keep it going, they're going to have to make the space shuttle do things for people because people is the key to anything we ever have done as a nation or will do as a nation. In 1948, the experts said it would be another 200 years before we'd make it to the moon. But in 1969, this Saturn V rocket was the initial stage of a delivery system which carried two Americans to its surface and brought them safely home. Today, this rocket is practically obsolete. The space shuttle has been born and with it the promise of new and even greater discovery. It's kind of hard to imagine, but someday even the space shuttle will become obsolete as we continue to step into the future and out of the past. So what does all this mean, these dreams of the past turning into modern day reality? Well, I'm convinced that it means that we can accomplish just about anything we set our minds to. We can continue to solve the most difficult problems that we face here on Earth, and learn new ways to improve the quality of our lives and the lives of our children. But first of all, we have to decide that that's what we want to do. And then we have to learn how to work together toward those goals. I know that it's true that you have to climb to the top of the mountain to see the other side. Well, we wanted wings, we got them. And we're beginning to use those wings to fly beyond familiar peaks to the far side of those mountains. We can't not do it. We must continue our explorations. We must open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to accept being the first among humans to enter the far reaches of space.